Okay, I just want to warn you guys that this video is going to be pretty long. So grab a snack or something. Sit back, relax. Hey guys, what's up? It's me, Isis the Enchantress, and welcome back to my channel. And if you're new here, welcome. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and click the bell to turn my notifications on so you don't miss a post for moi. And give this video a thumbs up. It'll really help me out a lot and it'll give me a general idea about what kind of content y'all like from me. I just want to get started with a quick disclaimer. All data and information provided in this video are for informational purposes only. All facts stated in this video are from the internet and I'm putting it into this video. I make no representations as to the accuracy, completeness, currentness, suitability, or validity of any information in this video. I will not be held liable for any errors, omissions, or delays in this information or any losses or injuries arising from its display or use. Quickly before we get started, I'm just going to advise you that I'm going to be talking about murder and it's pretty graphic, so just be warned before you proceed. Today we're going to be talking about a Scottish serial killer, but all his murders took place in London. We're going to be talking about Dennis Andrew Nielsen. He was born November 23rd, 1945 in Fraserburgh, Aberdeenshire, which is northeast Scotland. He committed a series of killings between 1978 and 1983, resulting in the death of at least 12 to 15 men. Not only was he a murderer, he was also a necrophile, admitting to sexual acts with the corpses of these men. Before he engaged in any sexual acts with the bodies, he actually bathed them, shave off any body hair, and apply makeup on any scars. I'll talk about his early life first so you can kind of have an understanding about why he committed these murders. He was the middle child of three children born to mother Elizabeth White and father Olaf Maksim who adopted the surname Nielsen. His father was a Norwegian soldier, part of the Free Norwegian Forces and traveled to Scotland in 1940 after the Nazi occupation of Norway. In Scotland, he met Elizabeth and married her in 1942 after briefly dating and they moved into Elizabeth's parents' home and her parents' name were Andrew and Lily White. So Olaf was so preoccupied with the free Norwegian forces, he was paying little attention to his wife and children, making little effort to move them out of her parents' home. So during his brief visits to the house, they conceived three children, Olaf Jr., who was the eldest, Dennis, who was the middle child, and Sylvia, who was the youngest child. After the birth of Sylvia, her third child, the couple divorced in 1948. Elizabeth concluded she'd gotten married too fast, quote, she rushed into marriage without thinking. Her parents agreed, but continued to allow Elizabeth and the children to stay at their house and were supportive of her after her divorce. As a child, Dennis Nielsen was described as quiet yet adventurous. He loved being taken on long walks in the countryside on his grandfather's shoulders, who he was very close to. Dennis would be only five years old around the time of these walks, but remembers them being, quote, very long along the harbor, across the wide stretch of beach, up to the sand dunes, which raised 30 feet behind the beach, and on to Inverlochy, which is about four miles east of Fraserburgh. He described his grandfather as being his great hero and protector, and I can only imagine that because his grandfather was basically his father figure, and I can relate to that too because my grandfather is most definitely like my father figure. His grandfather was a fisherman, and any time he was at sea, Dennis felt lonely, adding, life would be empty for him until he returned. Around 1951, his grandfather's health was declining, but he continued working as a fisherman. While fishing on the North Sea on October 31st, 1951, his grandfather, Andrew White, passed away of a heart attack at the age of 62. His body was returned to the family home before burial. Dennis can vividly remember his mother weeping, asking if he wanted to see his grandfather. He said yes, of course he did because he missed him. However, Dennis was taken to a room with an open coffin where his grandfather's body lay. His mother told him his grandfather was sleeping. In the years after his grandfather's death, Dennis grew more quiet and reserved. 
He often stood at the harbor alone watching the herring boats. While at home, he rarely participated in family activities, and any time an adult family member tried showing him affection, he repelled it. He felt like he was getting an unfair amount of attention from his mother, grandmother, and later stepfather in comparison to his older brother and younger sister. Dennis envied his brother's popularity. However, he was closest to his younger sister than any other family member, often playing games and talking with her. At Inverlochy in 1954 or 1955, on one of his solo excursions to the beach, Dennis became submerged underwater and was almost drug out to sea. At first, he panicked, flailing his arms and screaming as he gasped for air which wasn't there. He thought his deceased grandfather was about to arrive and pull him out before experiencing a sense of tranquility. However, someone else who happened to be on the beach pulled him to the shore before he could drown. Shortly after this incident, Dennis's mother took him and his two other siblings and moved into a flat. Later, she married a builder named Andrew Scott, and they had four more children. At first, Dennis resented Andrew as a stepfather because of his discipline methods, but he gradually came to have respect for him, and the family moved in 1955 to Streichen. At the onset of puberty, Nilsson discovered he was homosexual. Initially, he was confused and shamed, so he kept his sexuality hidden from his family and the few friends that he had. Many of the boys he was attracted to had some kind of resemblance to his younger sister. At one point, he sexually fondled his younger sister, thinking that maybe his attraction towards these boys might be because of the love and care he felt for her. On one occasion, he also fondled and caressed his older brother Olaf Jr. while he was sleeping, and this resulted in Olaf Jr. suspecting that his brother Dennis was gay and started regularly belittling him in public and calling him hen, which is Scottish slang for girl. Dennis made no attempts to have any sexual contacts with any of the peers he was attracted to, although he later said that he was fondled himself by a male older youth and didn't find the experience unpleasant. So he liked it. As he got older and progressed into adolescence, he got bored with life and stretching. There were limited entertainment amenities and care opportunities. At 14, he joined the Army Cadet Force, which is basically ROTC sponsored by the UK viewing the British Army as his escape from his rural origins. While in school, his grades were above average and soared in history and art, but he hated sports. He finished school in 1961 and worked in a canning factory for three weeks until he informed his mother that he intended on joining the Army where he wanted to train as a chef. Dennis passed the entrance exams in September of 1961 and he was enlisted for nine years service. Thus, starting his training with the Army Catering Corps at St. Omer Barracks in Aldershot, England. Dennis excelled in his Army duties and described his three years training in Aldershot as the happiest time of his life. While stationed in Aldershot, Dennis started having homosexual feelings again, but kept his sexual orientation well hidden from his colleagues. He never showered in the company of his fellow soldiers. Instead, he bathed alone in the bathroom to have privacy to masturbate without being caught. In 1964, Dennis served as a private in West Germany and began to increase his intake of alcohol. He described himself and colleagues as a hard-working, boozy lot and drunk a lot to ease his shyness. On one occasion, Dennis and a younger German guy drunk until they passed out. When Dennis woke up, he found himself on the floor of the young German guy's flat. No sexual activity was involved, but Dennis started fantasizing about having a young slender male sexual partner that would be completely passive to him. The fantasies grew from him fantasizing about his partner being passive to his partner being either unconscious or dead. On several occasions, Dennis attempted to have his body sexually assaulted by one of his colleagues. When they all would get together and drink a lot, Dennis would pretend to be more drunk than he actually was, appearing to be more vulnerable and fake passing out in hopes that one of his colleagues would make a sexual advance on his supposedly unconscious body. 
Dennis had a lot more experiences while in the army, but it wasn't until 1969 when he had his first sexual experience with a female who was also a prostitute. He bragged of his sexual encounter to his colleagues, but later admitted that he found intercourse with the female both overrated and depressing. Between October and December of 1972, Dennis went back to live with his family as he considered his next career move after he ended his 11-year military career at the rank of corporal on October of that same year. His mother occasionally voiced her opinion on his lack of female companions and her desire for him to get married and have children. On one occasion, Dennis, his older brother Olaf Jr., Olaf Jr.'s wife, and another couple were watching a documentary about male homosexuality. When the documentary was over, everyone made a mockery of homosexuals and joked about it. Everyone except Dennis. He started talking about gay rights, which started a fight, and Olaf Jr. informed their mother that Dennis was gay. Dennis never spoke to his brother again and kept written contact with his mother, stepfather, and younger siblings. He decided to join the Metropolitan Police and moved to London December of 1972. In April of 1973, he completed his training and was posted to Northwest London. He performed several arrests, but nothing too exciting for him. He missed the comradeship of the army and began drinking alone in the evenings. During the summer and fall of 1973, Dennis began frequenting gay pubs and engaged in several casual flings with men. He found these encounters to be soul destroying and a vain search for inner peace because he wanted a long lasting relationship. In August, after a failed relationship, he concluded his personal life being gay was at odds with his professional life of being a cop. So remember times were different back then. You have to think about how many people he actually had to hide the fact that he was gay from. His father passed away that same month in August and left each of his three children 1,000 pounds. In December, Dennis resigned from the police force. After his resignation, he had a series of security jobs. In 1979, Dennis was appointed to acting executive officer, but was promoted to executive officer in June 1982. And these were the occupations he held through his murders up until he got caught. In November of 1975, Dennis encountered 20-year-old David Gallican being threatened outside of a pub by two other men. He intervened before it could escalate and took 20-year-old David back to his room in the Crinklewood district of London. They spent the evening vibing, learning about each other, and drinking. Dennis learned that David had just moved to London from Weston, which is about two and a half hours from London by train. He also learned that he was homosexual, unemployed, and was staying in a hotel. The next morning, both men decided that they should live together in a bigger home. Dennis used half of the 1,000 pounds he inherited from his father and immediately found larger property. Several days later, the two went to see a vacant ground floor flat at 195 Melrose Avenue, which was also in Crinklewood. They decided to move in and Dennis negotiated a deal with the landlord where he and David got exclusive access to the garden at the rear of the property. The flat came with furniture, but not much. So over the following months, they redecorated and got new furniture for the whole house. Most of the decorating was done by David because he didn't have a job and wasn't too interested in getting one. So Dennis viewed himself as the breadwinner in the relationship. Dennis remembers being sexually attracted to David, but the two rarely had sex. Within a year of moving in together on Melrose Avenue, the relationship started to strain. They slept in separate beds and eventually started bringing casual sex partners home. By early 1976, the arguments were escalating. Dennis said a heated argument in May of 1977 caused him to ask David to leave the residence. However, later on during the investigation, David had stated that he was the one who ended their relationship. Within the next 17 months, he was in brief relationships with several young men, but none of the relationship lasted over a few weeks and none of these men had expressed an intention of living with Dennis on a permanent basis. 
By late 1978, he was living a solitary existence. Between 1978 and 1983, he's known to have killed at least 12 men and boys, although he confessed to 15 and attempted to kill seven others. Most of his victims were homeless or homosexual men. He killed his first victim, Stephen Holmes, December 30th, 1978. He had been drinking alone in his flat all day and decided he must leave his flat that evening and seek company. He met Stephen at the Crinklewood Arms pub. Stephen was actually trying to purchase alcohol but was unable to because he was 14. Dennis invited him back to his flat to drink but believed Stephen to be 17. They got really, really drunk before they fell asleep. When Dennis awoke the next morning, Stephen was still sleeping. Dennis states that he was afraid to wake him in case he left me. After caressing the sleeping youth, Dennis decided that the boy would stay with him over New Year's whether he liked it or not. Dennis grabbed a tie, strangled the boy unconscious, and then drowned him in a bucket of water. Dennis masturbated over the corpse twice before stowing the body underneath the floorboards, and the body remained there for almost eight months until he burned it in a bonfire he built in the garden behind his flat on August 11th, 1979. Eerily enough, one of his written recollections after the murder of his first victim was, quote, I eased him into his new bed beneath the floorboards. A week later, I wondered whether his body had changed at all or had started to decompose. I disentered him and pulled the dirt-stained youth up onto the floor. His skin was very dirty. I stripped myself naked and carried him into the bathroom and washed the body. There was practically no discoloration and his skin was pale and white. His limbs were more relaxed than when I put him down there." End quote. On October 11th, 1979, Dennis attempted to murder a student from Hong Kong named Andrew Ho. Dennis lured Andrew to his flat with the promise of sex but ended up trying to strangle him. Andrew managed to flee from his flat and reported the incident to the police. Dennis was questioned about the incident but no charges were filed. Two months after this murder attempt on December 23rd, 1979, Dennis met a 23-year-old Canadian student named Kenneth Ockden, who had been touring England visiting his relatives. They met in a West pub. When Dennis learned that Kenneth was a tourist, he offered to show Kenneth several landmarks of London, and Kenneth accepted. Dennis invited Kenneth back to his flat, promising a meal and more drinks, and he accepted. Dennis doesn't remember the exact moment he strangled Kenneth, but he remembers strangling him with the cord of his headphones as he was listening to music. He also remembered dragging his strangled body across the floor with the cord he just used to strangle him, pouring himself half a glass of rum, and continued listening to music upon the headphones he just used to strangle Kenneth. The next day, Dennis purchased a Polaroid camera and photographed Kenneth's dead body in various suggestive positions. He then laid the body on top of him in a spread eagle position and watched TV for a few hours. Then he wrapped the body in plastic bags and stored the body beneath the floorboards. On four occasions the following night, Dennis removed the corpse from beneath the floorboards and positioned the body so that he could seat it upright and placed it alongside him in his armchair as he watched TV and drank alcohol. Dennis went on to kill his third victim, 16-year-old Martin Duffy, on May 17, 1980. He was a student in Birkenhead and hitchhiked to London without his parents' knowledge. He had been sleeping in a near railway station for four days before Dennis discovered him as he himself was getting off a train. Dennis remembers the boy being exhausted and hungry and offered him food and a place to stay for the evening. Once Martin was asleep in Dennis's bed, Dennis ties a ligature around his neck and sat on Martin's chest while tightening the ligature with great force. Eventually, Martin was strangled unconscious and Dennis drowned him in his kitchen sink. His body was placed in a kitchen chair, then back into bed where he was strangled. His body was repeatedly kissed, caressed, and complimented by Dennis before and after he masturbated while sitting on the stomach of the corpse. For two days, the body was hidden in a cupboard before Dennis noticed the corpse was getting bloated. So he placed the body under the floorboards as well. After this murder, Dennis began killing more frequently. 
By the end of 1989, he killed at least five more victims and failed at killing another one. Only one of these five victims had ever been identified. Dennis's recollection of the unidentified victims are vague, but he could graphically recall how each victim had been murdered and how long the body had been retained before dissection. Dennis had tried to resuscitate one of the unidentified victims but failed, causing him to sink to his knees and sob before spitting at his own reflection in the mirror. The accumulation of all those dead bodies attracted insects and created a foul odor, especially during the summer months. On occasion when Dennis would remove a body from beneath the floorboards, he noted that some of the corpses had maggots crawling out of their mouths and eye sockets and was infested with bug larvae. Dennis placed deodorants under the floorboards and sprayed insecticides twice daily, but the odor of decaying bodies and the presence of flies still remained. In late 1980, Dennis removed and dissected each victim killed since December of 1979 and burnt them in a communal bonfire he made on a waste ground behind his flat. To mask the smell of the burning flesh pieces of six dissected bodies, he placed an old car tire atop of the fire. When the fire burned out and the ashes remained, Dennis took his rake and sifted through the ashes to ensure he didn't leave any bodily remains. He found the skull still intact and smashed it into pieces with his rake. On January 4th, 1981, Dennis met an unidentified man who Dennis described as an 18-year-old blue-eyed young Scott at the Lion Pub in Soho. He was lured to Dennis's flat on Melrose Avenue upon the promise of a drinking contest. After they both had a few drinks, Dennis strangled him with a tie and placed the body beneath the floorboards. Dennis told his employers he was unable to attend work because he was ill on January 12th. In reality, he was dissecting his previous victim, plus another victim he killed approximately one month earlier. By April 1st, Dennis had killed two further unidentified men. Dennis later casually reflected, end of the day, end of the drink, end of the person, floorboards back, carpet replaced, and back to work on Denmark Street. His last murder on Melrose Avenue was 23-year-old Malcolm Burlow, who Dennis discovered slumped against the wall outside of his home September 17, 1981. When Dennis asked what was wrong, Malcolm informed Dennis that the medication he was taking for his epilepsy had caused his legs to weaken. Dennis said that he should be in the hospital and assisted Malcolm into his flat and phoned an ambulance the next day. The next day, Malcolm was released from the hospital and returned to Dennis's residence to thank him. Dennis invited him in for a meal. After this meal, they both drank rum and coke. Malcolm fell asleep on the sofa and Dennis manually strangled him in his sleep. He stored the body underneath the kitchen sink the next morning. In mid-1981, Dennis's landlord decided that he wanted to renovate 195 Melrose Avenue and asked Dennis to vacate the property. Dennis was resistant at first but succumbed to an offer of £1,000 to vacate so they could proceed with the renovations. All corpses had been previously dissected except Malcolm's whose needed to be dissected so that he could burn all the pieces of flesh in a third bonfire. He set it up same as last time with an old car tire to disguise the smell of the burning flesh. He then moved to 23D Cranley Gardens. At Cranley Gardens, Dennis had no access to a garden, and because he stayed in an attic flat, he wasn't able to store any bodies beneath his floorboards. So for almost two months, anyone Dennis lured into his flat wasn't assaulted in any manner, but he did attempt to strangle a 19-year-old student named Paul Knobs on November 23, 1981, but restrained himself from completing the act. In March of 1982, Dennis encountered a 23-year-old named John Howlett in a pub. Dennis lured him to his home by promising to continue drinking with him. At Cranley Gardens, they both drank and watched a movie. Paul was getting tired, so he laid in bed, which was located in the front room. One hour later, Dennis tried to awaken him from his sleep unsuccessfully. He then sat on the edge of the bed, drinking rum, staring at Paul before deciding to kill him. Surprisingly, there was a ferocious struggle and Paul actually got his hands around Dennis's neck, almost strangling him. Dennis finally managed to strangle Paul unconscious with an upholstery strap 
and returned to the living room shaking from the stress of a struggle because he thought that this time he'd finally been overpowered. Over the next 10 minutes, Dennis tried killing Paul another three times and each time Paul was still breathing. So he decided to fill his bathtub with water and drown him. For over a week, Dennis still had finger impressions around his neck from where Paul attempted to strangle him. In May of 1982, Dennis met a 21-year-old homosexual named Carl Stoder. They were at the Black Cat Pub in Camden, and while conversing, Dennis learned that Carl was depressed following a failed relationship. While luring Carl to his flat with alcohol, he assured him that he had no intentions of any sexual activity with him. After more drinking in the flat, Carl fell asleep in an open sleeping bag. He later awoke to find himself being strangled and Dennis whispering loudly to stay still. At Dennis's trial, Carl states that at first he thought Dennis was trying to free him from the zipper part of the sleeping bag, but then he fell unconscious again. Then he vaguely remembers hearing water running before realizing he was submerged in water and Dennis was trying to drown him. Carl was able to raise his head above water and gasped, no more, please, no more, before Dennis submerged his head under water again and he fell unconscious again. Dennis thought he'd kill Carl, so he seated him in the armchair, but he later noticed that he was still alive. Dennis began to resuscitate Carl, increasing his heart circulation and covering him with blankets, then placed him upon his bed. When Carl regained consciousness, Dennis embraced him and explained to him that he had a nightmare and got caught up in the sleeping bag zip and that he, Dennis, had resuscitated him. Over the next two days, Carl was in and out of consciousness. When Carl had enough strength to ask Dennis about being submerged in water, Dennis said that Carl was in shock so he placed him in cold water. Dennis then walked Carl to a nearby train station and said farewell and hoped they would meet again someday. Three months after his promotion to executive officer in June of 1982, he met 20-year-old Graham Allen who was attempting to hail a cab. Graham agreed to accompany Dennis back to Cranley Gardens for a meal. Like many of his other victims, Dennis claims to have no recollection of the precise moment he strangled Graham, but he does remember approaching him as he sat eating an omelet with full intent to kill him. Graham's body was kept in the bathtub for three days before being dissected on Dennis's kitchen floor. He also informed his employer that he was ill and couldn't come into work so he could finish dissecting. January 26th of 1983 was when Dennis killed his final victim, 20-year-old Stephen Sinclair. Stephen was last seen by acquaintances of his in the company of Dennis walking towards the direction of a tube station. In Dennis's flat, Stephen fell asleep off drugs and alcohol in his armchair. Dennis approached him and said, oh Stephen, here I go again, before he proceeded to strangle him with a ligature made from a necktie and a rope. He noticed bandages on each of Stephen's wrists and upon removing them, he learned that Stephen had recently tried to kill himself by slitting his wrists. Following his usual ritual of bathing the body, Dennis placed the body on his bed, applied talcum powder to it, and arranged three mirrors around the bed before lying next to the body naked. After a few hours, he turned and kissed Stephen's lifeless body on the forehead and said, Good night, Stephen, and fell asleep alongside the body. Since moving to a new flat, he had to come up with a new way to dispose of the flesh. He would dismember bigger parts stored either in a wardrobe, tea chest, or a drawer located underneath the bathtub. The bag used to hold Stephen's remains were sealed by the bandages that were on his wrist before he died. Dennis tried to flush small pieces of flesh, bone, and internal organs of the people killed at Cranley Gardens down the toilet. He also boiled the head, hands, and feet to remove the flesh from these sections of the body. On February 4, 1983, Dennis wrote a letter of complaint to the estate agents claiming the drains at Cranley Gardens were backed up and him and other tenants were going in tolerance of these conditions. On February 8, 1983, a Dino Rod employee was responding to the complaints made by the tenants regarding the drains. 
Upon opening the drain cover at the side of the building, the diner rod employee discovered that the drain was packed with a flesh-like substance and numerous small bones of an unknown origin. He reported these findings to his supervisor and was instructed to wait until the following morning to do further investigation. Before leaving, the diner rod employee discussed the remains with Dennis and another tenant. He said that the flesh was eerily similar to human flesh, to which Dennis replied, it looks like someone's been flushing down their Kentucky Fried Chicken. At 7.30 a.m. the next morning, the Dino Rod employee returned with his supervisor. However, the drain had been cleared. This raised suspicion and they discovered scraps of human flesh and four bones that looked like they came from a human hand and a drain pipe linked to the top flight of the house. They immediately phoned the police, and when the police did further inspection, they found more bones and flesh. They sent these remains to the mortuary at Horsey in North London, where the pathologist professor advised that they were human remains and that one piece in particular, which had been from a human neck, had a ligature mark. After questioning the tenants of 23 Cranley Gardens, the police discovered the only tenant on the top floor was none other than Dennis Andrew Nelson. Unfortunately, Dennis was at work by the time they made this discovery, so the detective chief inspector and two colleagues decided to stay outside the building until Dennis's return. When he finally did return, the detective chief inspector introduced himself and his two colleagues. Dennis asked why the police were interested in his drain and if his two colleagues were health inspectors. The DCI replied, no, they're actually police and requested access to the flat to discuss the matter further. When the three officers entered the flat, they immediately noticed the odor of rotting flesh. Dennis asked again why the police were interested in his drain, and they informed him that the blockage had been caused by human remains, to which Dennis replied, good grief, how awful. In response, the DCI said, don't mess about with the rest of the body. Calmly, Dennis admitted that the remainder of the body could be found in a nearby wardrobe. However, when they got close to it, they noted the overpowering smell of decomposition. The police officers asked if there were any other body parts to be found, to which Dennis replied, it's a long story and it goes back a long time. I'll tell you everything. I want to get it off my chest. Not here at the police station. While being escorted to the police station in the police car, Dennis was asked if the remains belonged to one or two bodies, and while staring at the window, he replied, 15 or 16, since 1978. When at the police station, Dennis admitted to everything he could remember. He admitted to the murders, attempted murders, and the one occasion where one of his victims was on the brink of death but was revived and allowed to leave his residence. He confessed that there were further human remains stowed in the tea chest in his living room and a drawer underneath his bathtub. The same day, Dennis accompanied police to Melrose Avenue and showed them three locations in the back garden where he burnt the victim's remains and sure enough, investigators discovered 1,000 bone fragments and many of them were blackened and charred by fire. When asked his motive for the murders, he simply said, I was hoping you could tell me that because he was adamant that his decision to kill wasn't made until the moment before the act of murder. At 5.40 p.m. on February 11, 1983, Dennis Andrew Nielsen was charged with murder. On October 24, 1983, Dennis Nielsen was brought to trial charged with six counts of murder and two counts of attempted murder. He pled not guilty to each charge. However, he was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison serving a minimum of 25 years. Nielsen was still a prisoner when he died on May 12, 2018, suffering from a blood clot as a result of surgery complications. Well, that's it for this case. Can y'all tell that this was my first true crime video? I put a lot of time into this and I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more and see you next time. L-Y-B. Love you. Bye.